When I was a kid, no one would have ever imagined I would have become a professional model. My parents both worked opposite shifts and quick, convenient food was a mainstay in our household. By the time I was in second grade, I weighed 130 pounds. My favorite foods were Pop-Tarts, Fruity Pebbles, hot dogs, any type of McDonald's, and half-baked microwave cookies. But that was the 1970s, and that is how everyone around me ate. And actually, to think of it, really not that much has changed in how Americans eat. There you are. Yep, <laughs> chubby cheeks. There we go. <laughs> that was at the point where my dad was home with me at night, and my mom was working during dinner time, and um, he loved fried potatoes and Salisbury steak and eating two bowls of ice cream and I, I tried to keep up with him um, and then we'd watch TV and he would fall asleep on the couch and I would watch TV until he made me go to bed. Did you have junk food at your home? I can't remember like after school and stuff. I know we had pop tarts. Because um, we didn't get pop tarts, I know, <laughs> at my house. And so fast forward to present day life I never thought I would become sick. After two kids, I weighed 180 pounds and was officially middle-aged, 40. I didn't feel great, but that was because I was 40, right? Or maybe not. Here we go. All of a sudden, I had to give myself injections was on blood thinners, a statin, and receiving weekly, sometimes bi-weekly, blood draws. Here we go. I learned later this was all due to chronic inflammation. But what does that mean? This was no life. All right, got my prescription and my blood drawn for this week. I had to make a change. Right about the time that I turned 40, I just noticed that I didn't have the energy that I used to. I was never obese, um, but I had an extra 25 pounds on me that was just jello, um, not tone at all. So I just had that unhealthy persona just because I just didn't have a, any zest about me. I spent a lot of time on the couch, not because I wanted to, I wanted to do other things, but I just didn't have the energy. You feel very human in a bad way. You feel like, my God, what is happening to me? What happened to me? Um, but the whole experience, I remember before I even got released from the hospital, because literally it was a revolving door of tests and blood sticks and new news and News that was given in the morning was dismissed and new news and new things were diagnosed in the afternoon. It was just this whirlwind of like, what in the world is going on with me? That I, that like before my release, I just broke down and cried because you're just so scared. You're wondering what your future is going to be like. I did not want to continue to be this pathetic, sickly, sad person. And if I had any opportunity, to, if I had any way to change it, I was going to try. It is March 12th, April 7th, April 29th, May 7th, May 19th, June 11th, Wednesday. Wednesday! <laughs> I'm going to get my blood work done with my two monkeys today. <laughs> So I got busy and consulted the experts. What was chronic inflammation? And now that I had it, how do I get rid of it and become well? In the process of learning how to become well, I discovered a whole new medical world 
when I was hospitalized, I think she I was seemed like she was more educated about her potential diagnosis. She also was more interested in finding out uh, what the long-term sequelae could be and how she could alter the course. So she seemed a lot more motivated as a patient uh, than some of the other patients I see. Meet Dr. Hamid Basir, my rheumatologist, and Dr. Michael Twyman, my cardiologist. I was one lucky woman to have them by my side as I set out to become well. Uh, as you know, we have treated you for an autoimmune condition. Basically, these conditions come under an umbrella term of autoimmune chronic connective tissue diseases which involves your skin, your joints, your blood vessels, and everything that connects them. So it's basically your whole body, uh, especially the organs that you need uh, to move, to function, to perform your daily activities. So if, you, if we detect inflammation, uh, either in your blood work or abnormal antibody blood work, like we did in Ms. Lam's case, then it triggers a cascade of workup to determine is it all genetic, is it environmental, is it a combination of both? And most of the time it is a combination and by adjusting your lifestyle, you can actually address the underlying cause of these problems, which is chronic inflammation. So what this is um, showing is just that I'm kind of chronically inflamed, but we don't really know the, the reason at this moment. At this point, no. Inflammation is the fire in the arteries. If you can shut down that fire, you very significantly reduce the, that person's risk of having a heart attack or stroke. And inflammation is essentially your immune system is just turned on all the time and you have all these different chemicals going through your system and the arteries can just tend to get damaged as innocent bystanders. That inflammation can scratch the arteries and when the arteries are scratched, you have to repair those scratches. And cholesterol is one of those things that is part of the repair um, mechanism. It helps make new outer shells of cells to repair that damage. But if the inflammation is ongoing, those cholesterol particles, they get damaged as innocent bystanders in ways, and then they get stuck below the walls of the arteries and cause growing plaque. Inflammation is basically your body's response to a stress. It can be an antigen like a virus, or it could be um, uh, something in your lifestyle like smoking, diet, particularly uh, saturated fats, trans fats, high sugars that trigger inflammation by changing your gut bacteria, by changing your oral bacteria. And it leads to a chronic inflamed condition in your body, which turns uh, on itself, which is why it's called autoimmune, and these organisms or inflammation then attack your own body structures, like your blood vessels causing vasculitis or blood clots, even strokes, blood vessels in your heart causing heart attack, which is very common in smokers, um, and in joints causing arthritis. As far as inflammation, is when you look at um, the common American ailments, like heart disease, diabetes, stroke, all those problems are linked with chronic inflammation. And there's so many different problems that are related to nutrition and the American diet. It's all because of chronic inflammation. Yeah, yeah definitely for the most part. I mean, yeah, I'm a cardiologist, but the things that I do to help lower people's inflammation helps them reduce their risk of cancers, reduces their risk of Alzheimer's. So it's all intertwined. What about the importance of antioxidants? The general American public hears the term antioxidants and they know that it's good, but they don't really know um, the importance and how it works. Sure, so oxidation is a process that's occurring you know, millions of times a second in your body. As you're breathing in oxygen, you're burning fuel. And you think of oxidation as a process of, you know, if you've cut an apple and it turns brown, that's oxidation you know, rusting is oxidation. So, you know, when I tell people they have high oxidative stress, they're, you know, somewhat rusting from the inside. So getting, you know, your body makes antioxidants. 
Um, but you do typically need to supplement with your nutrition, and the best way is getting very colorful vegetables and fruits you know, into the system to help improve that. You know, other antioxidants are you know, green teas, red wine, those type of things can help too. But it's the antioxidants kind of help neutralize anything that's going on with the oxidative stress. And, and that in turn helps with the, the inflammation. Correct. So I mean, so, I mean your, your blood vessels, um, they're just trying to do what they're supposed to do. You know, blood's supposed to travel through them. Certain substances are supposed to be able to come through the walls of the arteries. Some things are not supposed to. But there's infinite amount of things that can damage those blood vessels but the blood vessels can only respond with three mechanisms, either inflammation, oxidative stress, or autoimmune dysfunction. And attacking those three things, you can shut off the damage to those arteries. And oxidation is just one of those things. Oxidation and inflammation, they go hand in hand. The more oxidation you have, you tend to have more inflammation. The more inflammation, the more oxidation. So you really kind of address both of them at the same time. And you're saying that through your choices in nutrition, you can put those items? For the most part, nutrition should be the, you know, the key for doing that. You know, sometimes you need to target certain um, supplements or vitamins if people are deficient and just not getting enough in their nutrition. Um, there are certain other advanced tests that can actually measure the um, nutrient levels inside your um, cells to see are you getting enough of these type of vitamins um, but essentially you should eat more vegetables and fruit than you really think you should um, you know 10 servings a day would be optimal it's very very low percentage of Americans get anywhere near that amount um, you know most of your meals should be at least 50 percent of your plate should be colorful vegetables Food, it's made up of carbohydrates, protein, and fat, plus all of these wonderful vitamins and minerals. And now that you've made all of these healthy changes, it's going to influence... Through a friend, I also consulted registered dietitian Jessica Stafford. I invited Jessica over to my house to cook with me and discuss nutrition. So for the past seven years, I have worked at the hospital as an outpatient dietitian. So I've had patients come in to see me and the majority of those patients are newly diagnosed diabetics. And I don't know if you know anything about diabetes, but when you're diabetic, you need to watch your blood sugar and you do that by watching your carbohydrate intake. Mm -hmm. um, another part of, of di managing diabetes is taking care of your heart. When you're a diabetic, you have an increased risk of developing heart disease. So I always go over heart health with my, my diabetic patients. Um, and I've learned that diabetes is a very um, related to chronic inflammation. Yes. I, I didn't realize that that was tied in as well, but it- Well, chronic inflammation, it can come from eating an excessive amount of calories or an excessive amount of carbohydrates an excessive amount of, of fat. It could be saturated fat or, or trans fat. So changing your, your diet and just being more aware of what, you, what you're eating, not only does it help you control your, your blood sugar, helps improve your heart health and also that inflammation. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about antioxidants and we know that they're good for the body, that they help uh, stop the damage of free radicals. And I have a really simple explanation of what the free radicals do. So if you think of a highway for just a minute, and all the cars on the highway are cells in your body, and let's say you see an accident on the highway, two cars, or think of them as cells, they collide, um, that's kind of like free radical damage. And those first responders, those police cars, the ambulance, the fire truck that show up at the scene and they kind of sweep away all the damage and, and take care of all of the the people who got hurt, those are kind of like antioxidants. So they kind of oh, sweep okay. in and, and take care of the damage and prevent other cars from, or cells from getting damaged too. Okay, I understand that much better. I've heard this term free radicals. Can you explain that? Free radicals is part of the oxidation process. So when um, cells get oxidized, they um, steal basically electrons from their neighboring cells to be more in balance. When they steal it, their neighbor cell now is unbalanced and that is a free radical. 
And so it's kind of like a daisy chain. The each cell keeps stealing, stealing the electrons from the other cells. And that just continuously causes damage. If you kind of take in more antioxidants with your nutrition, you can kind of provide some donor electrons to that process and try to quench that oxidation process. Your body's going to oxidize, that's what it does, but trying to prevent it from being um, over-oxidized, essentially. I didn't realize until um, recently in reading that, um, that oxidative stress can also lead to cancers. You're born with certain genes that predispose you to certain cancers, but many cancers are also de novo, meaning that they just spontaneously develop in a cell in your body that used to be normal, and just that those cells have been, over time, you know, bombarded with oxidation, inflammation. The, the DNA gets damaged, and then that cell starts making abnormal proteins, and the cell, once it starts dividing, then it has an abnormal twin, and then that's essentially what cancer is, it's just abnormal cells that don't have a mechanism to kind of shut off their growth. Mm -hmm. So what would you say um, is the problem with the common American diet? So the standard American diet is probably just, like a better term, they don't get enough vegetables and fruit in their diet. They're eating too much processed convenience foods, so they're getting too much extra sugar in their diet, too much salt, too much bad fat in their diet. Um, and it's that it's just very pro-inflammatory. Your body doesn't get the antioxidants from the vegetables and fruits to fight off the bad stuff that you're fueling the system with. I sometimes tell people that it's, you know, it'd be like putting diesel fuel in a regular engine car. It's gonna knock and not run well. So the standard American diet, it just tends to be very pro-inflammatory. We are what we eat. And it goes back to the old saying that if you eat right, you exercise, you adopt a healthy lifestyle, you cannot change your genes, but how your genes interact with the environment and trigger certain conditions, including these common autoimmune conditions like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, vasculitis, you can change the odds to the point that you can either prevent these conditions to develop in the first place. And once they develop, then you can reduce their pro progression by changing your lifestyle. There have been certain studies in the Middle East, Far East, and India where they determined that certain autoimmune conditions were less common than they are in the United States. And they went down to the basics and they determined that some of the ingredients in their diet could be one of the protective factor against developing these autoimmune conditions. And what they found is turmeric, use of garlic, and use of other ingredients such as curry are naturally anti-inflammatory. And conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus are less common in these countries. There is an association that if you consume diet that is naturally anti-inflammatory, it actually leads to less autoimmune conditions in the whole population which is very important looking at it from American perspective where more and more diet is geared towards junk food, quick food, microwavable food, where we use less and less natural ingredients and more and more processed ingredients that lose their natural qualities. So the diets that I recommend based on recent studies by American family physician are diets that are high in omega-3 fatty acids, fish oil, less carbs, vitamin C, turmeric, and other vegetables such as broccoli and Brussels sprouts that are very high in uh, natural antioxidants. The thing is that we all want quick results. So if you tell somebody that you need to work on your diet and you exercise versus take a pill, most patients, most people just want quick relief, quick answer. If they're hurting, they would rather take a medicine like hydrocodone or Advil to feel better but it's a quick fix. You're not fixing the underlying problem. I can make you feel better for the next 24 hours, but what about next month? What about next year? If you don't change your lifestyle and the core cause of the problem, you'll end up on these medicines, probably get hooked on pain medicines and end up far worse, reduce your life expectancy, 
and down the road you'll end up with a body that's just injured, inflamed, and just not happy. One of the challenges of conventional medicine is that it's very medication and procedural oriented. Conventional medicine is very good for acute care issues. If you have trauma, if you have heart attack, you have cancer, you want an acute care hospital to help take care of that. But if you have a chronic disease that you're going to have for many, many years, you know, the acute care hospitals are really not set up for that. You know, saying that there's a pill for every ill, you're just kind of putting a lot of band-aids on problems. And you said, you know, you start getting into the, you know, people on five, 10 prescription medications, even if you do five, 10 nutraceuticals, there's going to be drug, drug or drug vitamin interactions when you're doing that many things. So it's better to kind of step back, do some testing and figure out what is the root cause, why? Dr. Twyman is an integrative medicine physician who belongs to SLIM, which is the St. Louis Institute of Integrative Medicine. I reached out to the founder of SLIM, Kristen Brokaw. She was so kind to invite us to one of SLIM's dinners. We got to sit down with her as well as several SLIM physicians and discuss integrative medicine and how it is different than traditionally commonly practiced medicine. The message that lifestyle medicine, and lifestyle medicine means how you eat, how you breathe, the relationships you have, how, how active you are, how you move, um, what, you, what, what non-allergenic food you put in your body, what nourishing food you put in your body. So it all goes into this, this recipe of your health. And the doctors that I work with and the reason why I formed the St. Louis Institute of Integrative Medicine is that these physicians get that. They are not wanting a pill for every ill. They want to peel back the layers of the onion and say, why is your immune system going awry? Why do you have a dysfunctional cholesterol balance? Why do you have IBS symptoms and your GI tract is inflamed? What are you doing in your life? What are you eating? What microbes do you potentially have? So not just writing a script, but again, I want to do my due diligence and start figuring out why this happened. And that, to me, is I think how medicine was practiced years ago. And over time, we came up with the disease theory, which here's a medicine that's gonna fix this, and that works. That's awesome for acute care. But we took that model and we developed more pharmaceuticals for conditions that are truly lifestyle, uh, the cause is how the lifestyle of that individual is being lived, and we put drugs to it. So now you're not working anymore. Like, like you're trying to fix your stomach issues with a pill when you actually could fix it with your lifestyle. And so the physicians that I work with and the physicians who are a part of the St. Louis Institute of Med Medicine and the, and the physicians that practice functional and holistic medicine and spend thousands of hours and dollars to get this education are the ones who are constantly peeling back that layer of the onion and realizing that it is, what, it, what do we have, a toxic load in your life, what uh, foods, you know, uh, how are you moving, all those things, like I said, the recipe and they understand that that's truly getting at root cause, that's medicine, and that's prevention, so that you're not, again, gonna develop, God forbid, cancer, or something you know, serious down the road. You know, physicians don't get taught this. This is completely postgraduate education information. They have to want to know this information. So they graduate medical school, with the ability to practice medicine, and they're taught, you know, a pill for every ill. I have this they disease. Don't really, they don't really get nutrition classes. I mean, they might get the basic. I think maybe class. one class they're given, right? They're maybe given one class out of their whole uh, doctorate work, right, on nutrition. It is not taught. Every doctor would completely admit that, that this is nothing I learned in school. And now, how do I go get this information? I have to go spend time and money away from my family and thousands of dollars on this education, but it is so enriching. The physicians that do this, they love their practice again. 
They're getting people well. They're not just writing scripts. They're actually getting people well. They're inundated. They, they're inundated with patients. They can't, you know, they're so full. They're booking out for months because patients are so tired of being told, sorry, I don't know what's wrong with you. Here's another medication. You know, as the old adage says, they're sick and tired of being sick and tired. So when there's a physician that says, I work on root cause, I understand how your body functions as a system, and that's really the definition of functional medicine, is that each organ system cannot operate without the other, that a cardiolo cardiologist doesn't just look at the heart. Everything that else in the whole system is what brought that cholesterol in, you know, into that dysfunction. So, um, you know, you have diabetes. Okay, well, then you have to go see an endocrinologist. I don't deal with that. You know, we're not like a car in these individual parts that they can just be replaced. So functional practitioners look at the entire system and how it all works together. Well, as a primary care provider, um, we see chronic medical problems. Everyone's getting more and more problems. They're getting sicker and sicker, and we don't have answers. Things are happening that they never taught us in medical school. And so I started searching for answers. Um, heart disease, diabetes, osteoporosis was a really big one in my practice. So I started exploring and doing the uh, anti-aging and regenerative medicine, the A4M, got involved with SLIM here and um, started finding out there's so many causative factors of why we have medical problems that we have today. And there are things that you can do to reverse it. There are things that you can do to prevent it. And so I have worked really hard putting that down on paper, explaining that to patients. Um, a lot of the medicines that we use for those symptoms actually cause more medical problems and more nutrient deficiency. And it just is a downward spiral. So trying to go back to find out why do we have those problems? What can we do about it? How can we reverse it? And teach people what they need to do for a good, healthy body to make the body function at 100% the way it should every day when you wake up. I think one thing about American medicine is that if you're very critically sick, there's probably nowhere in the world you want to be. I mean, if you're having a heart attack, you go to a local emergency room, hopefully you're probably, you're going to get top rate care, you know, whatever, you're going to get a catheterization or a stent or whatever. I mean, we have the best technology, but where we fall down is that when you're not having that terrible acute medical problem or traumatic problem, we do a very bad job of keeping people from having that problem or preventing them from having it again. And that's where I think we really need to shift our focus. I mean, you look at our um, our major uh, uh, diseases that are, are breaking the bank and making our people sick, obesity, uh, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, hypertension, uh, cancer, all the autoimmune diseases, it's all nutritionally based. And yes, we've got some wonderful medications that can help with that, but until we really address the fact that this is all lifestyle and nutritionally based, we're going to continue to spend billions and billions and billions of dollars and have very sick people. So I educated myself about chronic inflammation, but implementation was still somewhat of a mystery until I happened upon Dr. Jessica Black's book at my local bookstore. The Anti-Inflammation Diet and Recipe Book would be a book I continue to reference and refer to others who have chronic inflammation. When I first started in practice, I prescribed an anti-inflammatory diet to so many of my patients. And so what I started doing is with each patient, I would maybe write up a recipe because I think it was really difficult because, you know, this is probably near 15 years ago. So it was, a lot, it was difficult. It was more difficult to find food choices back then, you know, because I was expecting people to not have gluten or dairy or sugar or all these inflammatory foods. So I started writing up salad dressing recipes or how to make a salad or how to experiment in the kitchen. And then at some point I just decided that I should put them all in a book mostly to kind of reduce my time also in the patient visit because I was spending a lot of time. I felt like going through all these different recipes and I found myself doing kind of the same things over and over again. I decided, just decided to put it all together so that it would be in kind of one nice, really easy to use reference. So with, with the readers of the book, you're kind of hoping to share as if they were in your um, exam room right. um, asking you, what do I do to... Um, 
combat this chronic inflammation, you are hoping to share this and kind of expand your practice in a way of helping others. Right. That's fabulous. And try to give them, you know, ideas for making maybe cooking easy. And so I think that it can be a really intimidating thing to initiate or to start because I think that if you don't know how to cook, you don't know really where to start. And then it can become like a stressful situation in the kitchen rather than a fun situation in the kitchen. Sure. Can you explain, I love your analogy that you gave on page 30 of the cup overflowing. Yeah, the cup analogy. I've been using that for a long time too. So I love it. And I love really kind of what it means to medicine. And if we think about kind of implementing this type of practice strategy into everybody's practices, I think that patients would be approached differently. And I think it's really important. So the main thought is if we look at everybody as having a particular t- capacity to take things in at some point after we fill, you know, it's like if we have this cup, if as we fill this cup at some point, you know, it's going to overflow. And when it overflows, it's overflowing with symptoms because the body has just a burden that it can't handle. So, you know, it starts with the genetic inheritance from mom's side, and then it has genetic inheritance from dad's side, any environmental toxins that people are being exposed to. Um, any kind of uh, pregnancy stresses or times in their life where maybe they were in school and not getting enough sleep or using drugs or, or having you know poor diet and lifestyle habits. And, and kind of as those fill the cup and then aging. So at some point, we start to overflow. And when we overflow, that's when we exhibit symptoms. So we might see high blood pressure or fatigue or insomnia, something like um, other you know deeper conditions, sometimes like diabetes, something of the sort. If we take that picture to the medical doctor at that point, or most doctors actually at this point in time, then what we say or what we look at is like, okay, so this person has high blood pressure and they have diabetes and they have fatigue and we kind of look in our cachet of things to use and maybe the naturopathic physician might use something different for blood pressure or um, the diabetes or the medical doctor might put, you know, prescribe a medication for those. But all of that approach is kind of coming from the top of the cup. So what we're doing is then just suppressing the symptoms. So we're almost just trying to put everything back in the cup so that the body isn't going to make any noise. And so if we just suppress the symptoms, then, you know, we're happy. But then what happens three or four years later? So essentially what I like to say is that, you know, it's better for us to take a step back across the street, look at the body from a little bit, you know, from afar and think about how the body got to this point. What, what kind of preceded all of these, you know, symptom picture to arise. And so then my idea is why don't we do a better job of making the body function a little bit better, setting a better foundation for health. And so that being said, the way that I feel like the body does best draining that cup is through all of its elimination organs. So the gastrointestinal tract, the liver, uh, the kidney, you know, sometimes if those are working really efficiently, we can make uh, the symptoms significantly better. Mm-hmm. So sometimes if those aren't working, you know, then then we can use some of our other organs of elimination like the skin and the lungs. If all of those systems are congested, we're going to either put things internally like, uh, you know, into the nervous system, or we could build tumors or fibroids or cancer or high cholesterol, inflammation, all of those symptoms are from the body being overloaded. It just doesn't have the the best kind of elimination processes that it's supposed to have. So different disorders appear in different ways in different people. Right. Yeah. Based upon kind of your genetic, you know, predisposition, you're going to have, you're going to manifest your problems differently. You put some very um, impactful statistics in your book about diabetes. Um, The fact that between 1980 and 2011, um, the diagnosis of diabetes has tripled and um, that 29 million Americans have diabetes, which is roughly uh, 9.3% of the population, which is huge. you talked about sugar consumption. How does sugar consumption differ today in children than it did, you know, 30 years ago? What are you seeing and what are the effects of that? Mm -hmm. Sugar consumption is probably, I think, our main detrimental problem. You know, I think that when we think about 
uh, eating an anti-inflammatory diet or we think about inflammatory foods and, and, you know, you can kind of give a huge list of them, but I really think that there are one of our main problems really is sugar consumption. And I think it really is leading to more than just diabetes. I think it's leading to chronic illness. I think it leads to cancer. I think it leads to, um, kind of like a increased, uh, you know, rate of aging. I think it is leading to obesity. So if you look at, you know, even obesity, people who are overweight and obese, you know, if you look at 50 years ago or 30 years ago, it was probably like one in every two. And now it's two in every three, you know, so we're increasing this percentage of how many people are obese and overweight. Uh, our adolescents, you know, if you look at kind of sugar statistics, I put these in my, in my next book, cause they're really, really, they're, they're kind of compelling to think about. So the average teen in America consumes 34 teaspoons of sugar every day in, you know, in equivalents of whatever they're eating. That is a huge amount of sugar. So if you can imagine then having all of that sugar, I think the average American also is around 24 teaspoons. So the teen obviously is eating more sugar than the, than the adults. But if you look at the, the recommendations from the American Heart Association, I mean, they say children should have three to four teaspoons per day. They say, you know, they say women and uh, teenagers or young, you know, young women, teenagers should have five teaspoons, you know, and the men, I think their, their recommendation for men and then older kind of bigger teenage boys is eight to nine teaspoons. Mm -hmm. So if you take that and then you kind of relate it to us having, you know, 24 to 34 teaspoons of sugar, depending upon our age, it's a significant difference. If you look at a can of soda, it's already 10 teaspoons. So, So if one kid is drinking one soda it's already double or triple what they're supposed to be consuming every day. And then that's not even in addition to maybe, you know, their sugar cereal in the morning or their cookie after lunch or, or whatever they're consuming. So I think, I think sugar is probably one of our most um, detrimental foods that we put, you know, kind of into our diet currently. And I think maybe, you know, I think that like with navigating all the food choices and navigating all the different diets out there right now, what I always like to try to tell people is that, it doesn't even really matter sometimes what diet you're choosing, but if you're choosing change, it's important, you know, so change your lifestyle, make sure you're active and, you know, cut out sugar. And I can guarantee that almost every diet that's out there is going to cut out sugar. So, you know, whatever diet it is, they're not going to say that you should consume more sugar. <laughs> <For our health. laughs> those are, those are start, that's startling information there regarding how much sugar that that people consume nowadays. Um, let's talk about what is what is an anti-inflammatory diet? Like, what does yes. that look like? When when we look at anti-inflammatory diet, what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, pick a diet that's going to fit most people. Obviously, you can't pick a diet that's going to fit everyone, but we're going to look at the foods that kind of cause the the most um, kind of stimulate stimulatory of, uh, effect on inflammation. And then also kind of pick some of the foods that have a little bit more likely to have, you know, maybe people have food sensitivities or food intolerances to, so that we're getting out anything that's going to trigger the immune system and that we're removing anything that's going to stimulate inflammation. And that, you know, that's really important because most of the top leading causes of death in in the United States are inflammatory related. Um, So anyway, so an anti-inflammatory diet to me means, you know, kind of getting out the sugar, uh, getting out the gluten, especially in the United States, because gluten is very different in the United States than other countries. Uh, getting out the dairy, uh, getting out some of the nightshade family uh, foods, um, and then like tomatoes, maybe potatoes, because potatoes also are very high in sugar. And then uh, really thinking about getting out some unhealthy grains. So sometimes corn can affect some people. So what I would say is that when we first start the diet, if you're really strict, you know, 30 to 60 days, then what can happen after 30 or 60 days, number one, you feel a lot better. Number two, then you can start introducing some of the foods back in to see if they really affect you. And then you can figure out the best diet for you. Right. Yeah. Because like you said, some people are sensitive to dairy and gluten and they have to figure that out and adjust accordingly. Yep. Um, so you, you've mentioned like most or a lot of the um, causes of death in the U.S. are related to chronic inflammation. Um, what, what are those specifically? Yeah, so if you look at the top 10 leading causes of death in the United States, there's only two that are not related to inflammation. So our top leading causes, you know, are uh, heart disease, number one, for both men and women. Actually, heart disease is number one for both men and women all throughout the world as well. 
Um, but yeah, so heart disease, we have cancer, we have stroke, we have diabetes, we have Alzheimer's, we have uh, COPD, so like kind of uh, obstructive pulmonary disease, so uh, kid um, lung illnesses. Uh, we have kidney illnesses, uh, like nephritis and kidney disease. You know, it, you mentioned cancer because I don't think a lot of people um, connect cancer with diet um, and the food that they um, are taking into their body. So how would you tie that together to make people understand that connection? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I would say about cancer is it's very epigenetic process. So um, what that means is that we might have this genetic predisposition towards it, you know, and we look at a lot of these people who are uh, testing the breast cancer gene or, you know, looking into other cancer genes that, you know, they know their family has had a significant history of it. But it's very epigenetic, which means that, you know, there's also people who have cancer family history that don't get the cancer. So what are these people doing that the people who are getting the cancer are not doing or vice versa? And so then if you look into epigenetics, epigenetics is um, a simple way to think about it is um, it's almost like, needing an environmental trigger or some kind of trigger to uh, stimulate that disease to occur. And so I would say the same thing with cancer is that you have this, you can have this propensity for cancer based upon your genetics, but you put that child into a home where, you know, you eat an incredible diet, you eat a lot of vegetables, they're super nurturing and warm. And, you know, this, this child may not get cancer, you know, because we've changed uh, kind of it's the whole environmental um, like onslaught or insult that that child might have. But then we put another child with cancer genetics into a family that's, you know, it's a crowded household and they're smoking in the house and this child is eating poor foods and not exercising and maybe being neglected. And we, and we see those people in the future and they've had this epigenetic process that's occurring where the environment will trigger those genes to um, turn on and code for cancer. Is there anything that I didn't touch on that you think is really important for people to know? Um, you know, what I would say is that whenever we're talking diet in our um, kind of in, in my office with my patients, one of the things I like to talk about is making sure that they understand moderation and that uh, not everything has to be so black and white or cut and dry. So what happens is that oftentimes if someone tries to do a new dietary change and then on one day they fail, then like the next day they've quit. I couldn't do it. I'm going to make this diet change and I'm going to make it for life. And, you know, if I have a day that I cheat, then I have a day that I cheat. I'm going to get back on it the next day. If I have a day that I eat sugar, I eat some sugar, you know. So the whole idea behind this is that this should be your lifestyle change. And if you if you make some mistakes along the way, everyone makes mistakes along the way and they learn from them. And so I really stress moderation with my patients. I really want them to be strict at first so that they can really figure out maybe their allergies or what they're being uh, kind of eating that's, you know, they're reacting to. But for their future... I think moderation is really important. I think keeping in balance is really important. I think exercise is really important. I think that we can't go so diet crazy and not put that in. I think that people who are exercising and doing a really good job of being active, if we look kind of, you know, back in our ancestral history years ago, um, you know, that people were hunting and gathering. They were never sedentary. And so then I think that if we put the person today and we get them exercising and they're very active, I think they can be much more lenient on their diet because it's, it's this whole process of, um, you know, improving health and it's not, it's not just one thing. And I think sometimes that willpower, you know, I think that uh, some people have it and some people don't. And I think that people who have the willpower look at the other people who don't have the willpower and they're like, why can't you do better? Or why can't you just say no? And I think that, um, I think what happens sometimes is people's biochemistry really wins. And, and if they're, they're significantly lacking in something, I think that they have a really harder time saying no because they're, they're eating that food to fulfill something. And so I think looking a lot deeper into people and seeing kind of maybe where the deficiencies are, I think is really important so that they have a more successful future at being able to uh, follow certain kind of dietary lifestyle changes. Sure. Absolutely. Well said. Mm -hmm. um, thank you so much. I think yeah. you're brilliant. I'm so glad I came across your book. <laughs> Thanks um, for having me. So informative. And um, I can't wait to put this in the documentary. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time.
Then there was exercise, lots and lots of exercise. I enlisted exercise physiologist and personal trainer Patrick McKee to help me get on track. I don't really like calling it a workout session, we call it kind of training. Like we are training you for this hour for the rest of your life. So it is supposed to be hard. It's, you're not supposed to walk out being like, I feel great. <laughs> you know, you might emotionally feel good, but physically you should be tired. Hey, you're coming to me at 40 years old, of 40 years of doing nothing, maybe even the last 10 years of doing nothing and incorrectly, and you want me to fix you in a month, you want to be able to go run a marathon or do whatever. And so you, you find people want that quick fix? Yeah, they want their quick fix. That's how our society is with everything. We want it now. <laughs> we want it yesterday. We want it. And anyway, I surely don't want to put any work into it at all. Video games, TVs, computers, you know, super comfy couches with coolers built into the side because God forbid you actually have to get up and go get something out of the refrigerator when you're sitting around doing nothing. Um, it's causing a big problem. Um, so we consider it sedentary. And sedentary is doing less than 30 minutes of exercise less than four days a week. So it can, to be considered an active lifestyle, it's at least four days a week, at least 30 to 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous exercise. So you're gonna lose weight, you're gonna get off medication, you're gonna be in a better mood, you're gonna look better, you're gonna feel better, your confidence is gonna be better, your joint health is gonna be better, so you're gonna be moving easier, bones are gonna be better when you get older, your posture is gonna be better because of that. It keeps on going. So like I said, it really depends on each specific person. I've never had a workout where I was done working out and was in a bad mood or in a worse mood than I was when I started. It's always gonna make you happier. Or maybe I'm just so tired, I don't care anymore <laughs> about whatever it was that was bothering me. Um, Says so stress relief. Yeah, it's wow. a great stress reliever, it really is. I also fell in love with dance fitness. Instructor Melanie Gibson had her own health challenges with an inflammatory disorder, fibromyalgia. She was inspiring. Some people say, well, showing up at the gym looking like I look, is intimidating because people are intimidated about the gym in the first place. And when they come and they see me, they're like, well, I'm never gonna look like that, so I'm just not coming back to the gym. And I need to have people to realize that I didn't come to the gym looking like this. I had to work for it. And if you want to get there, you can do it. You don't have to look like me, but you can be a better you. You just have to keep telling yourself you can't give up because you feel, I mean, I felt like I wanted to. You know, and there were a lot of times where I did go through a depression, but you just have to keep pushing and, and keep believing that um, it gets better. The big day had finally come. It took a year and a half of very hard work and revamping a lifetime of bad habits. I had completed a bunch of blood tests ordered by my rheumatologist, Dr. Basir, and my preventative cardiologist, Dr. Twyman. It was test result day and I was nervous. In general, I can uh, say with confidence along with your cardiologist that your pro-inflammatory condition is under complete control and there's very, very little possibility that it will go on to cause any kind of vascular damage in the future. That's fabulous news. Yeah, congratulations. Thank you, thank you so much. And, and very well done Both as far you. as your lifestyle is concerned. I truly got a wake-up call and I truly got a second chance. I had accomplished my goals to reverse my health for the better. Now it was my chance to help others. About the same time I became well, a friend of mine from grade school posted a cry for help on Facebook. He had diabetes, and it was getting progressively worse. With a family to support, he worried that he would not be around to provide for them. This should be why he's doing it. And this is why I should be doing it, and this is why we should also should be doing it. I wondered if I could help him by showing him how to eat nutritious, real food and exercise. It could not hurt to try. For 40 years, I was eating sweets, never really took care of myself. I got so used to just eating basically whatever I felt like. In my 20s, uh, when I first became a, a police officer, I worked midnight shifts where the only thing that was open were gas stations. And the only food they had there were donuts. I mean, back then, that's all there was. Mm -hmm. So, meh. Yeah kind of indulged and, and it was 
quick and it was easy and of course it was tasted taste awesome anyway. Right. Just didn't really take care of myself. Uh, got injured on the on the job. It got to a point where uh, my health was starting to deteriorate. And then one morning, remember that I a constant thirst. I mean, just mm -hmm. like it, to a point where I was drinking water, I was drinking soda, I was even drinking milk, and I didn't really drop on liking milk all that much. And finally went to see a doctor, and it's like, oh, you have diabetes. And here lately, my numbers are just, they're starting to skyrocket. Very much. Really? They're very uncontrollable. I mean, he'll go one day over 400. The next day, he'll go down to 147, hmm. or sometimes hours. Not even a full 24 hours. Right. I mean, it'll be like eight hours. Okay. And it'll move down. And have they talked to you about nutrition at all? And they your did, intake? but they weren't too detailed. Okay. I Just mean, basically, I was told, you know, watch your sugar intake and watch the carbs. Well, when I first got diagnosed, I didn't know what that meant. Mm -hmm. What do you mean, watch? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, they weren't too clear on what they were talking about. Uh, well, and sugar is hidden in so many different things, and if mm -hmm. you're not Right, and at the time, they, they knew I had, at, you know, uh, high, high sugar readings, but they didn't know what was causing it. So the past, you know, three to four years, it's just been, well, let's try this, let's do this, let's, let's take this out and put this in. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm taking upwards of 2,500 milligrams of medication mm -hmm. for diabetes and Literally it's just there's no end in sight. I mean, you know, every couple of months I go in and they check and they're like, oh, you know, your, uh, your, your A1C, which is your, your monthly uh, uh, sugar intake, it's just getting higher and it's getting dangerous. And, and there was, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't want to cut you off, but there was, I mean, one time, this was the time that he, they just upped his, um, he takes uh, oral metaphorum is what he takes, mm -hmm. insulin. And he, the, when they upped this, before they upped it actually, the reason he had an episode where he did not know what he was doing. He went, he was behind the wheel driving and had no idea where he, from A to B, how he got there. Oh my goodness! Was I that mean, it was when you were hospitalized because you were hospitalized yeah. not too long ago. Yes, right? and that brought yeah. And I've gotten to a point now when when it spikes that high, I'll know the warning signs. Usually, it's just you're nauseous, mm -hmm. or you're. I, I was confused. I mean, I was actually driving and like didn't even know where I was. It's hard at first. It was hard for me at first to change the way I'd always done. Um, but then once you do it, it becomes the new habit, you know? Mm -hmm. And then what you used to do seems so foreign and, and not even appealing. So you just have to get over that hurdle. Once we get it controlled, and, and definitely he, he can do it. I want to get it. it to a point where it's instinctual, to a point where mm -hmm. it's like, I don't even think about it. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I go to the grocery store. I know exactly what to get. Mm -hmm. Right. Because it's all and up it, here. And it will. And I hope so. you have to. I found that you can't dabble in it. You have to be all in, because if you if you you dabble, then you're still going to have those cravings for the bad things that you love. After John and I met, I followed up with him periodically to see how he was doing. He was really running with what I had discussed with him. The prevalence of diabetes is growing at staggering rates. We met with endocrinologist Dr. Nosaurus Mixida to discuss what needs to change in our society. When you are done by the end of the day, it's 5 p.m., 6 p.m., you have to go and see your family. You don't have the time to exercise. So I thought about it myself, and I wanted to prevent myself from developing diabetes and I wanted to be a role model for my patients. So I looked into walking treadmills and I went to the local places and I tried this machine. And first I was worried that will I be able to function and type while I'm walking. So before my, I spend my money on this, let me try it for a while before I buy it. And you know, this has been a while for, uh, around for many years 
maybe for people who are attending lectures or like watching TV, some people were walking on the laptop, so I said, um, I can do it, let me try it. And I tried to type uh, something and uh, I didn't make any mistakes. And then I decided to get it. So I donated my desk and now I'm doing this every day. I'm not sweating, you know, I have to wear a tie and I have to be well dressed to see my patients. So I'm not running on it, I'm not sweating. Just simple walk uh, in between patients from 8 a.m. till 5 p.m. And by the end of the day, I can check my calories and it's higher than 500 calories, sometimes 800 calories, just simply by walking. And uh, I'm not sweating, I'm still good. And I feel a lot better. I lost weight over the past year. Um, I feel much better. And I think, you know, I'm a good example for my patients and I'm losing weight and you know I'm exercising while I'm working so I'm getting paid for this time you know and I have more time to spend it with my family when I get back home every day With all that had happened to me, I could not help but reflect back to how I got sick in the first place. It all started with the habits I developed as a child. Pediatrician and integrative medicine physician, Dr. Anu French, shares her insights in regards to American healthcare and the importance of establishing healthy habits early in children. Why this is important as a practice is because right now I think we have a crisis in healthcare, especially when it comes to the health of children. We have a generation of children that for the first time are not going to outlive their parents. And that to me is sobering. We have a generation of children whose life expectancy is going to be shorter than their parents. We are calling this generation, Generation RX. And one in 13 children today has a food allergy. One in 68 children has autism. One in three children has some sort of chronic illness, asthma, ADHD. And a lot of that is associated with overweight, obesity, and mental health. Today, I think most healthcare providers that provide care for children are compassionate and caring but they just don't have enough time because of the healthcare system's focus on quick fixes and the band-aid approach. Um, trying to just fix the problem that the child has come in for or focusing just on the, the system, like the ear or the nose or the stomach. And so I think that what's necessary really is education and coming to a point where everybody's practicing integrative medicine, educating providers about how food can be medicine, how you, you can train a child to learn how to go to sleep quietly and calmly. You can show a family some mind-body tools, mindful eating, mindfulness that helps them all calm down and deal with anxiety together. We can educate families about environmental toxins and how to avoid them. We can educate them on vaccine safety and drug safety and food safety. So I think the ultimate goal for any integrative practitioner is to educate the community, educate the families, educate colleagues that there is a better way, a different way of providing health care to children. Tomatoes that we grew in the garden. I think that awesome, they taste so good. I want to instill in kids healthy habits early so they would not face the health problems that I had to overcome. I wrote a children's book called Superhero Healthy Henry Discovers Planet Earth to give kids a healthy living role model. My mission is accomplished, Henry says, time to blast off. 
To share the book's message of healthy habits, I began to give presentations at local schools, community centers, and a wonderful new museum in St. Louis called HealthWorks Kids Museum. I'm Shannon Woodcock, President and CEO of HealthWorks Kids Museum St. Louis. You only get one life. I want to live. I want to see my daughters graduate from college and walk down the aisle someday. I want to know my grandchildren someday. I want my life and I will continue to fight for and nourish my life. My life is no longer a gift I take for granted. I now cherish it every single day.